Hi, and welcome to the Business Revolution podcast. My name is Rob Yates, and together with Mark Hopkins, we're going to be bringing you a special guest today, a guest that we are delighted to interview. When you get to interview somebody whose life goal is to help you create your journey of profound well-being and fulfillment. You cannot help but be excited. And that is what we have for you today. Professor Srikumar Rao, author of four incredible books, speaker of TED Talks, and the author and deliverer of a course that has touched me, changed me, influenced me, Creative Personal Mastery. Be prepared to be wowed by insights, advice, and stories that is going to make you change what you do today. This podcast is sponsored by the Tetricky Business Secrets Club, our free membership program with no catches, no credit cards, no commitments. But you can go and join and receive over £20,000 of business coaching every year for free. You can simply join by visiting www.tetrakey.com and clicking the link in the homepage of the website or clicking the link in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's move forwards into this amazing podcast. In life, you are offered opportunities that are completely no-brainers. I was fortunate to be on a global talent program for a company who truly valued and invested in giving their future leaders access to incredible minds who are going to challenge them in ways that they have never been before. One opportunity that I was given was to attend Professor Rao's course called Creative Personal Mastery. Now, the word course probably doesn't give CPM justice. However, when I first met Professor Rao, I wasn't in the greatest of space. I just lost a child, was grieving, upset, and pretty angry. And probably the first time I met Professor Rao, I wasn't ready to listen to the message. But as any great leader, as any great person does, I wasn't shunned. And over the following weeks and months, I slowly became receptive to the advice and wisdom that Professor Rao was generous to share. The time with Sri Kumar Rao changed how I saw the world and how I lived my life. And he also helped me go through losing a second child and the terminal diagnosis of my only living child. Now, this was not part of the course. This was just Professor Rao being an awesome human being. The world doesn't have enough Sri Kumar Rao's in it. So I'm just grateful to have crossed paths with him and now get to spend more time with hearing his wisdom and advice. Professor Rao, before we start, I would like to thank you for getting me through dark times and now giving up your time to be with us today. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, Mark. It is totally my pleasure to be that. And I didn't really get you out of anything. You did that. I am delighted that I was able to be of some help and service, but know that you did that. You have wellsprings in you that you do not even imagine. And I'm glad that I was instrumental in helping you tap into that. Uh, yeah, no, it's always, um, it's always uh, like I said, there's, there's times when you meet people who help. And I think it's, it's interesting that you say, and I think it's something that I'd like to, to start talking about, which is around um, inner strength. It's around finding something inside you that allows you to get through things. And I'm looking at today's society, society and probably some of the challenges that we face today. Uh, and I'm just interested in your observations in today's society, things that excite you about what you're observing and maybe things that you're looking at in a, a degree of frustration or um, things that you're looking that we can possibly do slightly differently to, to maximize what we have available to us. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let me share a story with you, Mark, and this is a very powerful story and I'll explain the relevance to you. 
Uh, there are many versions of this story, but I like the one that I'm about to share with you. Uh, it <clears throat> comes from the Native American tradition, and there is a young man who is about to take his position with the adults of the tribe, and the final step was a talk with the medicine man. And here is this wolf, malvolent, vicious, cruel, ready to strike out and kill anything and anybody. And the dog and the wolf are fighting. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you. And the young man says, which one will win? And the medicine man says, whichever one you feed. Now think about it. Inside each one of us are altruistic. Let's make the world a better place and help our fellow man impulses. And in each one of us, there are, let me grab everything I can for myself and the devil take the hindmost impulses. The two are always fighting with each other. It is your job to selectively identify and feed the dog within you. Don't make the mistake of thinking you're only going to feed the dog. That ain't going to happen. The best you can hope for is you're going to feed the dog a little bit more than you feed the wolf. But if you do that, the dog becomes stronger, and it's your job to selectively identify and feed the dog within yourself. It is also your job to selectively identify and feed the wolf. Uh, sorry, it's also, <coughs> scratch that. It's also your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in everyone you run across. And when you do that, when the dog and you becomes friends with the dog and the other person, magic happens in the world. And the reason I bring that up is if you look at the world today, you have an enormous number of people who have come to power and are remaining in power by feeding the wolf. And feeding the wolf is easy, and you get a lot of people who are dedicated supporters, and you incite a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of hate. And all you got to do is read the headlines of the newspapers to see that this is happening worldwide. Now, to some extent, this is frustrating because obviously we're going in a direction where there is more anger, more jealousy, more hate, more feeling of us versus them. And when it's us versus them, we have to do what we can to stamp them out uh, violently if needed. And uh, that makes the world a very unpleasant place. But at the same time, I believe that as a result of such forces being unleashed, there are counter forces coming up to people who say, gee, we've been apathetic and quiescent too long, and we now have to step up to the plate and make sure that the dogs are fed and not the wolf. And I see many signs of that coming too. So we're certainly living in turbulent times, but I am cautiously optimistic that out of all of this, we will come will not only be peaceful, but also progress in terms of our inner growth. Remember stuff like the United Nations and the international institutions that uh, we love so much happened directly as a consequence uh, in the aftermath of the greatest conflagration the world has ever known, which is the Second World War. So yeah, we may pass through some turbulent times, but I'm cautiously optimistic that on the other side of that, we will come off better and individually and collectively we will grow. It's great that you're optimistic and I think it's where a lot more people need to be. I think there's sort of two, two questions then that, that follow on from what you said. One is, what are the triggers that you're observing at the moment that gives you that sense of optimism? And secondly, if... With your optimism, what kind of world are you imagining will be in, say, five or ten years' time? What will be the difference to what we're experiencing at the moment? Uh, I will answer your question, but the second part of the question, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to say five or ten years, more like 20 or 30 years, certainly beyond okay. my lifetime. What I see is that there are a whole bunch of people who were basically apolitical and they are now coming around and saying, I was apolitical, I was wrong. You cannot stay away from it. Freedom, democracy, and so on are things that you have to actively nurture. It's not that you get it once and then it remains forever. You have to guard it jealously. And we have not been guarding it jealously and that's why this happened. 
The second thing I'm noticing is that many thoughtful people are saying, you know, we actually brought this upon our own heads because we are so comfortable living in a bubble where we were doing well that we completely ignored big chunks of the population, both within the United States and outside, who were hurt by the capitalist system that we unleashed. And it is time that we actively looked at what we are wreaking and decided, is this the world we want to live in? So people are thinking about that and addressing issues which uh, they hadn't even considered before. So that's what makes me guardedly optimistic. I think the capitalist system is a wonderful one. It has certainly raised lots of people out of poverty, but like all systems, it needs rules, it needs boundaries, and those we have not supplied. And there are people who are now gearing up, very bright people, and saying, okay, we need to tinker with this machine to make it uh, adequate for the new world that we are going into now. Yeah, it's, um, I'm glad that uh, we're very, very fortunate to be living in, that, in a society, I think, where we are gonna, we're going through such immense transitions. We are, we are seeing changes happen that um, we probably... 20 years ago, wouldn't even imagine that they could exist. And I'm looking at my son who's nine and I'm, I'm trying to imagine a time when he's my age. So in 30 years time, when he's living the life to his fullest, I'm just imagining what kind of society he will be living in, how he will be operating based on the things that we are introducing and sharing with our kids at the moment. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion to be having around what are the lessons and what should we be doing with the 9 10 15 year olds at the moment what are they what would you say are the, the lessons and the the conversations we should be having with them to to help what the society is going to look like in 30 years time i think the most important single conversation you can have with your child or people at any age is to get them to realize that the world they live in is a, a construct it's an internal world. We think it's an external world, but it's not. The external world is a reflection of what is happening between our ears. But we all make the mistake of thinking that is the reality. It is not. It is not the reality. It is a reality. And we constructed it with what goes on between our ears, our mental chatter and our mental models. So how we experience the world is something that we choose. The problem is we never recognize that we have chosen it. We think it happened. It didn't happen. We chose it. We constructed the world that we experience. But we never recognize that this is in fact what we did. So if you can get people of any age, but especially young persons to realize that, then uh, we, you'll have done them a signal service. And young people, by the way, are particularly open to realizing this if you point it out, because they don't have the baggage that they have to unlearn that we do. So they can get it like that. It's such a... It's a, such a and again, we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, around creative personal mastery because it was something that fundamentally changed my mind. Um, but again, I just I go back to what you just said around um, our constructs. And when when you're having conversations with your child and they you, you play the game and they say, if you could pick one superpower, what would it be? I always I always say, I'd love to have the superpower that I could see the world through another person's eyes <laughs> yeah uh -huh. <laughs> just to see i just i'd love to be able to compare something that says this is how mark hopkins observes this uh -huh. i want to know how professor rao observes it and i just think it would be it probably would be the most enlightening thing that a human being could have is to see exactly the same thing that they're seeing through another person's eyes with the other person's interpretation yes. of exactly the same thing they're seeing absolutely that would be a great superpower to have yeah, I think that's if someone's listening and there, there, someone can invent that. Let's see if we can invent that superpower. I think that'll be a fascinating one. Um, so I'm really obviously um, fascinated in your story and then I cannot wait to get onto, onto CPM and we can start talking more about this internal construct and mental models 
Um, Because it's something that I I try and understand on a daily basis around a concept called the ladder of inference and and how we go up and down that so quickly and, and understand the impact that each run can have on your daily construct. But I'm just fascinated, Professor Rao, how did you, so born in India, schooled in India, moved across to the US, started off in the corporate world, um, and then PhD in marketing, and then moved into academia. Um, Do you want to just share a little bit of insights in terms of that journey? And obviously in today's society, which is incredibly fast paced, and there's a lot of people making big decisions all the time, uh, you made some some massive changes and decisions uh, moving from India from the US into the corporate space, moving into academia. Just share with us a little bit this, the stories, the processes that you went through in terms of those big decisions. A lot of my life I was drifting, Mark. So uh, I was a good student. So when I went to college, I specialized in uh, physics because you know that's what you did if you're a good student. Actually, I should have gone to engineering school, but I got a scholarship and the scholarship was not valid for engineering, but it was for hard science. So that's why I decided to uh, major in physics. Uh, I discovered early that if you were a good physicist, you did not eat very well in India in those days. So I said, <laughs> okay, here is this new thing called the MBA. So let me do that. And uh, the primary attraction for an MBA was if you did it, then you got a high paying job, which seemed attractive. (laughs) And towards the end of my MBA, I took the GMAT. At that time, it was called the ATGSB. And I did well. So I knew I could get admission to practically any school I wanted. And I really had no, not much interest. And here are all these great universities saying, dear Mr. Rao, please come to PhD. We will give you fellowship. That means money. So that was a no brainer. So I said, yes, I'll come. I came to Columbia because it was a great university and it was in New York, which seemed like a cool thing to cool place to be in. And I did my PhD in marketing because at that time, Columbia was the world's best school in marketing. So happenstance drifting just happened to be very gifted academically, and this seemed the logical way. So that's how my life progressed. Then I uh, got a job. While I was at Columbia, I got a job at Water Communications, and I did spectacularly well. In my early 20s, I was head of corporate research for Water Communications, reporting directly to the president. So heady days. But I got burnt out by corporate politics. So I said, gee, let me go to academe where there is no politics. I was very naive in those days. Discovered how much politics there was in academia. <laughs> I had made the transition. <laughs> and uh, then what happened was that uh, I stagnated. You know, all my peers who were in the corporate world went ahead and did spectacularly well. And I was stuck in a you know academic position. You don't make a lot of money in academia. And I was married. I had children and saying, gee, you know, what happened? I had such a brilliant career and now I'm stuck here and not going anywhere. And I really felt sorry for myself. And uh, one day I had a bright idea. All my life I'd been doing a lot of reading, spiritual biography, mystical autobiography. They take me to a wonderful place. And I came back to the real world and it sucked. And I remember thinking, if all of this is useful, only if you're sitting think, quietly thinking peaceful thoughts and not when you <laughs> came to the hurly burly then it's useless. But somehow I knew it wasn't true. Somehow I knew this was very valuable stuff. Maybe even the only thing that was valuable, I just hadn't figured out how to make use of it. So one day I got my bright idea, which is why don't I take the teachings of the world's great masters, strip them of religious, cultural, and other connotations, and adapt them so they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. And the thought of doing something like that made me come alive. So I was a marketing guy, so normally whenever I got a bright idea, I'd immediately ask, will others be interested? Is there a market for it? This is the first time I didn't ask the question. My initial thoughts were, I teach MBA students. We all know what MBA students are like. Nobody is going to register for the course, but that was fine. If they did, wonderful. If they didn't, God bless their souls. But I had to create the course for me. I did. And it worked out well. I modified it, offered it again. It did better. I moved it to Columbia Business School in 1999. 
And then it's spread by word of mouth. It's spread to London Business School, to Kellogg, to Berkeley, Imperial College. I taught it at programs like uh, the one you attended at Prudential. And now I teach it privately in New York, London, and San Francisco. So that's how it evolved. As you remember, Mark, I state in the syllabus that this will profoundly change your life. And if it doesn't, we both failed. And the reason I can make that statement so boldly is because of where I draw the material from. I've taken the teachings of the world's greatest masters. I've stripped them of religious, cultural, other connotations and adapted them so that they're acceptable to intelligent people in a post-industrial society. So how could it not change your life? It absolutely does. If you do the exercises, your life will change profoundly and for the better. So I was one of the... Uh, I've been very fortunate to be on CPM, and it's um, a course that has, uh, as you said, touched and impacted many people's lives. And, and for me, it was, it didn't start off, uh, it starts off as a real challenge, the actual course, as, as things that you've taken as your truths, are, you get given a different perception of those truths. So I'm really, do you want to just give uh, an overview to our listeners around CPM, and then we can we can delve into some of the the questions around CPM and and some of the practical things that 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 you uh, drive during that the journey that people go on. Sure. So CPM, that's what's what is CPM? CPM stands for Creativity and Personal Mastery, and my goal in Creativity and Personal Mastery is to show you exactly what we talked about earlier in this podcast, which is the world you're living in is not a real world. It's not the real world. If you don't like it, there's hope. You can deconstruct the parts of it that are not working and build it together again, according to principles that I share with you. And you don't have to believe my principles. You just have to try it out and find out whether it works for you in your life. And this is a rest of your life journey, Mark. In other words, CPM is not something that you take. It's a journey you embark on and it lasts the rest of your life. You begin this journey, you do not end it. It ends when you do. And I think that's um, obviously one of the things that you, you talk quite a, long, a lot about in CPM is it's creating your journey of profound well-being and mm -hmm. fulfillment. Um, that is exactly and correct. And that's always yes. something that, again, for me, was the hardest part to accept, I think, because um, a lot of times in life, we are looking for other people to give us answers. We are very good at making excuses why things haven't gone as we expected, and we're even better at blaming other people for our either inadequacies or our failures. Um, and CPM correct. basically is all about in my, how, how, one of the biggest lessons I took out of that is, as you said, the, world, the choices are your choices. The outputs are driven by yes. the choices that you make, and it's not about other people. Correct. How, how do you find that journey? Obviously, uh, having delivered it countless times to thousands of people, um, how do you see mm -hmm. that journey going through people? What do you observe? What are the... What are the the, the bits where you can see the penny dropping, what helps people see that, that moment? And I'm just fascinated for our listeners to, to, to hear that. What happens is, uh, as you know, CPM originated as a business school course at many top business schools. And in my syllabus, I state, this course will profoundly change your life. And if it doesn't, we've both failed. And that sentence caught a lot of attention and people say, it's a business school course for heaven's sake. What do you mean it'll change your life? And uh, a lot of skepticism. And I discovered early on that you cannot teach an MBA student anything. The reason my course wa worked is because I didn't try to teach them anything. I just said, hey, Obviously, some things are not going well in your life. So why don't you try what I'm saying and see how it works in your life? You don't have to believe it. Just try it. And they try it and they come back and say, son of a gun, it really does work. And that's how you can literally trace the path from skeptic to believer to, in many cases, evangelist. 
because it really does work. If it doesn't work for you in your life, it's not for you. But it does work because the principles are so powerful. So that's how the transition, I can, I can see you know, it happen routinely in many, many, many business school courses I've taught. And now I really don't have the same issue anymore because the people who now come to my programs are paying top dollar and they've done their homework and they're already inclined in that direction. Many of them know others who have taken the program, which is why they're there in the first place. So they know it works and they just want that work to happen in their life, the changes to happen in their lives. So they're already a predisposed audience and it works like gangbusters when you come with that attitude. So you've mentioned there around uh, the principles behind uh, CPM mm -hmm. and obviously the driving principle is around the, the constructs and the mental models that you, you place on yourself and how that transfers into how you live your life. Exactly correct. Uh, I must you make just your mark that we all have mental models of this is the way the world works. The problem is not that we have mental models. Mental models are wonderful devices. They help you make sense of unstructured situations. They save you time. The problem is not that we have mental models. The problem is that we don't recognize that we have mental models. For most of the people who come to my programs are very successful persons defined in conventional terms. So obviously a majority of the mental models they have are serving them very well. But there are some mental models that we all have which are not serving us well. In fact, I'm gonna make a bold statement to you and listeners of this podcast. Every time, not some of the time, not most of the time, every time you have an, an, a situation in your life that you find unpleasant and it persists, you're using one or more mental models that are not serving you well. And when you identify those models and make changes in them, poof, the situation is going to dissolve just like that. That's how powerful these concepts are. Yeah, and, and having, I'm a, I, I, I not only believe you by the words that you're saying, I believe you because I've seen that in myself and it's, it's fascinating I, going when you went, I've been to a situation really recently where I felt I'd been let down. And when I felt I was let down, the emotion that comes out and the behaviors that come out are anger mm -hmm. because it's anger placed at that other person because of the belief that they have let you down. Therefore, you have a right to be angry at that person. Exactly, yes. <laughs> which actually serves me as mark no benefit or no purpose at all all it does it gets me even more angry more irate and is more limiting to to me mm -hmm. and it's until you actually change your mental model to remove the feeling of it was done to me mm -hmm. and therefore i have no reason now to be anger angry mm -hmm. do you actually uh, are you actually able to move on with that scenario and situation Mm -hmm. Exactly correct. Yes, but it's it's a hard journey to go through. It's uh it's not it's not easy to let go. Um, and are you able to give just one or two little pieces of advice for for those in terms of of how to be able to to distance yourself from the feeling of being done to to actually what's in your control? Absolutely, the most powerful single tactic you can use for this mark, and it's got very wide applicability is to just be aware that you're going through this phase when you're angry you feel let down he should have behaved like that but he behaved in such a contemptible despicable way recognize that all of that is mental chatter their thoughts going around in your head you don't have to identify with the thought you can step back and watch the thoughts and when you step back, that's known as being in the witness stage and observe these things happening in your head, as opposed to being carried away by them, you will find that they lose a lot of their power to take you to places you don't want to go. And the more you can put yourself in the witness position, as opposed to, I am really angry position, the easier you will find to channel it in directions that you recognize are better. 
Yeah, it's such a profound statement there around uh, the witness witness stage. And it's something that reminds me of, and it goes back to your, your story at the start around the dog and the wolf. Um, and I think about uh, a roommate a lot of the time. So we've all, I'm sure we've all um, had those roommates who possibly weren't our first choice. They were either didn't wash up or they were messy or they always came home late or whatever the scenario that, that, that wound you up. Um, and what you end up doing is you start resenting that. And I always look at it sometimes when I get into those states, I've got a roommate in my head. Yes. And that roommate yes. doesn't shut up. It's constantly going on. Yes. And it's until I actually take that roommate out of my head and almost put it next door to me yes. that I can turn that off and then see the world through a different light. Exactly correct. Yeah, that's a very, very, very good analogy. So for, for listeners, when you're struggling around that, the, the wolf, and you're struggling around being able to observe it, just imagine that you've got the roommate in your head and just take that roommate out of your head, put it on a park bench, take that roommate out of your head, put it on a park bench and talk to it. And then every now and again, you are allowed to, to tell it to shut up. It's okay to tell your roommate to shut up. <laughs> and maybe sometimes you just want to go and <laughs> strangle him and drown him in the bathtub at the same yeah, time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, you mentioned there that um, we all have mental models and they are good. Um, but they're not always sometimes serving us uh, to the best of our ability. Um, just, just for those uh, listeners who, who are struggling to understand the concept of a mental model, are you able to give um, maybe an example of a, a mental model that you see uh, in society quite a lot? Oh, sure. A mental model is basically we have, which is a, a notion of this is the way the world works. And the more we invest in our mental models, the more we believe it, the more it seems as if this is the way the world works. But that's not the way the world works. It's our model of the way the world works. And the more we believe in it, the more we build a silo ar around ourselves. And sometimes it's so thick we can't break out of it. One mental model that a huge number of people have is, if I had more money, my problems <laughs> would be solved. Yep. Yeah, we all believe that. You know, I, I've got to go off and get more money because if you could. And uh, that's why I love uh, the quote, which uh, I'm paraphrasing now, but it came from the actor Jim Carrey. And he said something to the effect of, I wish everybody could become rich and famous so they could discover for themselves that that's not <laughs> where it's at. So it's, it's a model. We believe in that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I really love, and this is a, a humorous statement, but it's humorous because there's so much truth in it. I know money will not make me happy, but I want to discover that for myself. <laughs> yeah, the famous but. <laughs> yes. So these, these are all models we have, and we believe them very strongly, and we work, work on that. And uh, very frequently, they let us down. Now, I think money is great. Money is, an op is energy. It can accomplish many things. It can help you accomplish many things. But the thing that it will not do is it will not in and of itself bring you any happiness at all. And this is something you have to discover. Practically everyone listening to this podcast is on a path of growth and they have more money and more material things now than they did 10 years ago with probably no change in their emotional well-being. In fact, if anything, they're worse off than they were before. And if you pause to actually reflect upon it, you'll recognize the truth of that. Yeah, you know, definitely. I think there's um, three things that are just coming to my mind as you're, as you're talking about that mental well, There's a few things. There's one around the, the differences or similarities between mental models and truths and what our truths are versus what other people's truths are. And again, it comes back to our interpretation of the world that we live in and the constructs that we've placed on it. The second thing I'm interested mm -hmm. in, in for you, you start talking about emotional well-being. Um, and obviously, um, there's three things that I'm always debating in my head around um, emotional well-being, happiness, and usefulness, um, and how the three of those um, interchange, interlink, and whether actually they're they're mutually inclusive or mutually exclusive. 
Okay, let me answer that uh, very quickly. In my view of the world, the ideal situation is when you are anchored in a very deep feeling of well-being. The knowledge that you are okay, you have always been okay, you will always be okay. In fact, you cannot not be okay. You are in the human predicament. As long as you're in the human predicament, stuff will happen. There will be serious illness and death. There will be financial setbacks. There will be business reverses. There will be relationship problems. All of that is part of being in the human predicament. You will deal with each of these situations as appropriate, but you will deal with it from the space of I'm okay and I have always been okay. And that makes a tremendous difference in the emotional domain you occupy and the actions that you take. It is possible for us to find such an anchor. So when you're talking about you're useful, you set about being useful from the domain of I'm okay, I've always been okay, so this is how my life is going to go. And, you know, one of the things that I advocate, and you'll remember that from your experience at CPM, where you talk about the other-centered universe, the only way that you're going to get to something like that is if you can devote your life to be of service. You are there to be a channel through which a greater good is brought to a greater community. And you have tremendous flexibility in defining both the greater good and the greater community. But unless you can find something which is bigger than you are, to which you can subsume, if not your whole life, at least a big chunk of it, you're going to live a mediocre existence. Right now, in this podcast, what you're doing is exactly the same. You are hoping to transfer some of the benefits that you got to change my life. It could change yours. Pay attention. And if people pay attention and they start implementing some of what I'm sharing with you, their lives will be improved. So you have directly contributed to the betterment of somebody's life. Is it a dozen people? Is it a thousand people? Is it a million people? Who knows? You're doing the best you can. And that's, again, I'm, I'm going back to what you said earlier, which um, is around why you started CPM and, and who you started CPM for. You didn't start CPM mm -hmm. for anyone else apart from you had to do this. This is something that was important for you. And out of yes. that starting point, um, I'm sure as you were doing, you were building it, you were thinking in your mind, wow, this could be beneficial to lots of other people, but I'm not doing, I'm starting off by doing it because it's okay. I'm okay, but I want to share this. And I think it's something that um, the listeners can take, take away from this is, is that's not selfish. What you're saying, and I think people perceive this around doing it for me as selfish. I think we struggle with the difference between understanding me and understanding who I am and the perception around selfish. How would, you, how would you feel about that? I run into that all the time, Mark. So when I do the other centered universe, and particularly when I was teaching at business school, I can't tell you the number of people who came up and said, Professor Rao, let me get this straight. You say that I should be a service to others because that will make me feel good. Yes. So then it's really all about <laughs> myself, isn't it? And the short answer is, this is a baby step. It's like training wheels on a bicycle. Once you learn how to ride the bicycle, you take the training wheels off. So yes, initially you start off as an experiment. Let me try to be a service to yourself. And I enjoy being a service to myself. It improves my life. But if you do it long enough, eventually you're going to be a service to others, not because you want to feel better, but because that is now the outward manifestation of the kind of person you have become. And that's when you'll get the greatest benefits. You're no longer trying to be a service in order to feel good. You're simply doing it because that's the kind of person you've become. Yeah, it's, um, and again, what I can imagine listeners at the moment probably either scratching their heads or going, jeepers, this is, this is profound and life-changing and I have... I have no idea where to start. But I'm just going to share one practical thing that I, I did as I tried to, to translate my lessons from CPM into being a father. 
And it was as, as small as, Seth, when you are going towards a door and there was someone coming in or going out, open the door. Um, and at the start, he asked the question to me, Daddy, why am I opening the door? Um, but the more, as I answer that question, he then starts to understand why he's opening the door. And now he doesn't even think about it. He just opens the door because it's serving other people. And it's not about the reaction he gets. Because as all kids, we want that reaction, don't we? We want the, you're welcome, or thank you so much for opening the door. So you get that instant gratification of, I've done good. Where if you repeat this enough, and again, so ladies and gentlemen, don't, don't think of this as you have to fundamentally change everything about it. Start with baby steps, like Professor Rao said. Start by opening the door, but op don't open the door for somebody else expecting a thanks. Just open the door. Exactly correct. In fact, if you expect thanks, you've just blown the spirit of the exercise. Yeah. And then, but it's an interesting journey that people have to go on because... We do have this, again, it's our mental model of if I do good for you, then you need to acknowledge that good as well. What kind of person are you if you don't say thank you? But again, it's all around those mental models. That is so accurate. It's a fascinating yes. way about changing. And again, all we're talking about today is, is under, step one is understanding and appreciating you have mental models that influence everything that you do. And step two yes. is identifying which of the mental models are not benefiting you. And then step three right. is, would you recommend step three being articulating a, a new mental model, a new truth, or is it a trial and error? What is it? Do you articulate where you want? It's a combination of both. You basically say this mental model is not serving, serving me well. Can I adopt this alternate one? Well, if you remember, Mark, one of the more powerful exercises you had when you took the program was the alternate I reality see. exercise, where we take a situation of uh, which is of concern to us and create an alternate reality. It's kind of complicated to explain, but if any of your listeners are interested, my book, Are You Ready to Succeed, has very detailed instructions on how you do this. When you create an alternate reality, you find that there is a profound change in your life almost instantaneously. Yeah, I remember it clearly because it was it's one of the things that I probably found the hardest to do because you are, it's, it's almost like, it's the same thing I can, again, uh, I, had, as most, I had a blanket when I was a kid. And it, for me, it was the alternative reality is just like getting rid of your blanket. It's your, it's your, <laughs> It's your safety net. <laughs> yeah. It's a thing that you've held onto because it, it is your reality. It's something you're so comfortable with. It's your, I'm sure we've all got it, Professor Rao. It's our favorite jumper that we never want to throw away. But it's uh, what purpose? That jumper is so holy now. It's not actually keeping us warm. So what's the point of keeping on it? So you're um, an author of four books. So it's, um, we've got in 2006, you released uh, 2005, Are You Ready to Succeed? Um, 2010, right. Happiness at Work. Um, right. you, uh, the personal mastery program um, and the happiness right. matrix. Um, just very the happiness matrix is not by me. It's someone took a bunch of thing, talks that I gave and strung them together. But it's all your content in terms of the talks that you gave and, and the yes. creative part. That's great. Yes, um, yes. I just like to briefly touch on happiness um, because it's a, sure. it's an interesting debate that we have with with a lot of people around: um, is happiness something that you should be chasing? No. In fact, the very act of chasing happiness will drive it further from you. I, I have an example I use. Imagine that you have a puppy and you're playing with a puppy. And the more you go towards the puppy and try to make friends with it, the more it runs away. Well, you sit down ignoring the puppy and start reading the newspaper and very soon you feel its <laughs> nose buzz. Happiness is like that. Don't chase it. Let it have come. Viktor Frankl put it beautifully. He said, happiness, like success, cannot be pursued. It must ensue as the unintended consequence of something much larger. Yeah, so for me, that's my, A, it's my favorite book, Victor Frankl, A Man's Search for Meaning. Um, and again, in that book, the, the happiness quote, and also when he talks around choice. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think choice and happiness for me are, are two powerful things to think about. So yeah, we, we, we talk a lot about, Happiness. It's not something you can wake up and go, today I am going to focus and work on being happy. 
um, I find it quite an interesting uh, discussion where people say, I want to focus on being, how can you focus on, on being happy? How can you, and that's where for me, I'm, I'm, uh, I'd like to go back to that one about usefulness and, and the mental models of uh, a greater good to a greater community. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's getting over those, because uh, no journey is a straight journey, no journey is a smooth journey. There are those, those dips, there's those corners that we've got to go through, and it's, it's the challenge of a New Year's resolution. It's, it's staying true to the path that you're going on. And, and I'm sure in CPM and, and the alumni, you've, um, and I was one of those ones who really struggled to get onto the path of CPM, how, how do you help people who are struggling to stay on the path or um, have gone through a, a dip? Uh, what, what kind of advice would you give them to get back onto that journey that they've chosen to be on? Uh, I talk to them. I remind them of the CPM exercises and how powerful they are. But most of all, I get them to understand, and it all goes down to what you said a little bit earlier, just a few minutes ago, where you talked about choice. We really have a choice each day. I can get up in the morning and I have a choice. I can be happy or I can let the world knock me around. So things, people who are determined to knock me off my perch, they're going to tell me all the things that are wrong in my life. They're going to put frustration blocks in my business. They're going to do things to knock me off my perch if I'm going to be happy. And each time one of that happens, I decide, am I going to let this person knock me off and therefore this person decides how I'm, I'm, I am going to feel? Or am I going to simply hold on to my resolution and whatever this person does, he does, but he doesn't knock me off my perch because I've decided I'm going to be on that perch. And if you approach life that way, you will find it works. So you go to work and uh, you find, uh, gee, your accountant has embezzled uh, $100,000 from your thing. Are you going to let your accountant knock you off your perch of being happy? Of course not. You are going to continue to be happy. Yes, you now have a situation that you have to deal with, but you will deal with it from the space. Remember what I said, your anchor? I am okay and I will always, so I'm going to remain in that anchor. And yes, here's a situation I have to deal with, so I will. But it will not knock me from the anchor unless I let it. That's what people don't recognize. They said, they think things happened. He did this to me. He made me angry. No, he didn't make you angry. The only person who can make you angry is you. And once you recognize that, you take responsibility for the emotional domain you occupy. And when you do, your life really turns around. There's one word that just comes up time and time again. Whenever I speak to you, I read your books. Um, I read your, your posts on the alumni, and it's, it's a, probably the most powerful word that we forget about and we don't use enough. Um, and that word is I. We, mm -hmm. We're very good at saying, like you just said there, you gave that example of he, they, we. But actually, the only word that, that matters is I. I am okay. Mm -hmm. I am happy. It is my choice. Um, and I think this listeners just... Exactly. Uh, we've, Professor Rao talks about individual accountability, individual responsibility. It is, it is completely up to you how you see the world. It is completely up to you how you yes. react to someone else's mood, yeah. to someone else's, your perceived uh, mistakes that they have made. Again, it's your perception that something has happened that shouldn't have happened. But the only person who can control how you react is you. Uh, that is it. Exactly correct. Yes, and I think that's um, a really profound, profound one for our listeners to to actually make that choice. You you have the choice, ladies and gentlemen, of are you going to be dictated to by others, or are you going to maintain and control what you want to achieve in your life? Because it is up to you. It's completely up to you. No one else can tell you what to do. No one else can tell you to go through a red traffic light. It's your choice. The consequences are out of your control, but your choices are in your control. Um, I've just got a couple of uh, articles I read of yours that I'm really fascinated just to share because I think they're, nice, they're very practical uh, things that we can share with our listeners before we unfortunately wrap up the conversation. And, and one of the ones is um, 
the ones uh, an article you got interviewed on on CNBC around stress. And obviously, we're living in a world at the moment of uh, perceived stress. I have a, a, an issue with the word stress anyway. But what <laughs> the, <laughs> okay. the article that you wrote was around um, stress and how to make uh, everyday life easier. Uh, do you mind sharing those those top top five tips? Because I'm pretty sure there's listeners at the moment who are feeling a perception of stress and would love to know how to to live a life easier. <sighs> the way we think about stress, Mark, is dead wrong. I've asked thousands of persons this question on six continents. Virtually everybody reports they feel stress. Many report they feel more stress now than they ever have before in their lives. So we are definitely living in an era where more people feel that they have more stress in their lives than ever before. And I ask them, why do you feel stress in your life? And of course they have reasons and they come up with them. And I've broken them down into eight categories. And they range from financial, relationship, business and career issues, health, and so on. And what I point out is that they're wrong. These are not the reasons that you feel stress. There's one reason and one reason only that you feel stress. And the one reason you feel stress is you've got a rigid idea of this is the way the universe should be and the universe is not playing ball with you. So you think that you should get promoted, you should you know, get a salary increase and your boss gives you a pink slip. You want the universe to be a particular manner and it isn't and you resent the fact that it isn't and you resist it and that is the only reason you have stress in your life. Now, people come back to me and say, what do you mean accepting it? Don't I know that all of the big changes in the world happened because somebody didn't accept it? You know, that we have the vaccine for polio because Jonas Salk did not accept polio? That is a misreading of what I just said. Accepting means you acknowledge that things are not the way that you would like it to be. You have a vision of the world, and when you have a vision of the world, it is incumbent upon you to try your level best to make that vision succeed. You may succeed, or you may not. If you do, wonderful. If you don't, wonderful. What is important is that you try your level best to make your vision a reality. Most of us make this fundamental error. They think the objective and the benefit of setting a goal is achieving the goal. That is not accurate. The benefit of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is the learning and growth that happen in you as you try to achieve the goal. If you succeed, wonderful. If you don't, wonderful, provided you have genuinely tried to achieve the best. Uh, provided you have genuinely tried your best to achieve the goal. And when you look at that, that's a no-lose proposition. Achieve it. If you succeed, fantastic. If you don't, fantastic. The learning and growth have already happened in you. Achieving your goal is a bonus. If you live life that way, you always win and will always be okay and cannot but be okay. Yes. It goes back to that anchor that you talked about, I'm okay. That's why I, I struggle. I think it was it's thanks to attending CPM that I now, I don't believe in stress. And I don't know if it's something that you can or cannot believe, but I don't, I don't I've, I've never, after everything that I, again, gone through personally with, I still exactly. don't feel I'm stressed because... I don't let other things dictate to me how I am or how so I what are you saying, so Therefore, how Mark, can I be stressed? Is, yes, there is stuff happening in my life that I have to deal with, but I choose not to experience stress. This happened, obviously, I would prefer that things were different, but it isn't. This is what the universe gave me. So I will deal with it as best I can, as best as I think appropriate, but it will not affect my emotional well-being. I will not be held hostage to tragedy. I will deal with the tragedy, but I will not be held hostage to it. 
And again, I, I really want to make sure that listeners understand the difference of what we're talking about here, because what we're not saying is accept what you're dealt with and roll over and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying is, if it's still important to you, you need to drive for what is important for you. But we're saying, do not let yourself emotionally be held hostage by it. You sure. still need to be passionate. And there's frustrations that I have in my life that I'm just not willing to accept. I'm still going to push forward because it's aligned to my values and what's important to me. But how I go about it is not through blame or being held hostage to it. I just see it in a slightly different way. So I think it's very important that. Extremely important, yes. Uh, do not, do not, uh, we're not advocating just accept everything that's thrown at you. We're advocating, understand that how you interpret that is 100% in your control. It is, I am not, they did. Exactly correct, Mark. So, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up at the moment. Um, I, it's kind of conversation that um, I'd want to, you'd love to carry on for three, five, ten hours. There's so many things that I'd like to, to probe deeper in there. But um, as with all our, our guests, there's a couple of questions we asked um, all our guests. And um, I've got a couple for you, uh, Professor Rao. Um, the first one I'd like to ask you is, in 50 years' time, how would you like people to be speaking about you and the impact you've had? Uh, actually, I would like people not to be speaking about me at all, but I would like them to be speaking about, you know, I recognize that I have made my life the way it is, and I am really the architect of the, my experience of life, and I'm going to go every day and make it better. And one of the ways in which I'm making it better is I'm going to help other people experience their life better. And this is a chain reaction which spreads all over the world. And that's what I would like to see have happen. Um, and I think that is a fantastic way to, to wrap up uh, this podcast with, with that statement, the statement of I and doing what feels right for you for the benefit of others and, and maintaining that control. Um, Professor Rao, I would like to thank you immensely for, for this podcast. Um, for those of our listeners who want to get in touch with you, who are interested in joining one of your uh, CPM classes, what's the best way for our listeners to, to find you? Uh, the best way is to go to my website, which is www.therauinstitute, T-H-E-R-A-O institute.com. If they want, they can email me, and my email is srikumar.rao at therauinstitute.com, S-R-I-K-U-M-A-R dot R-A-O at therauinstitute.com. And uh, I would love to have uh, any of your listeners on my program. I have both online and live programs. All the details on my website, so whatever works for them, great. Perfect. And um, being an alumni for the CPM, I, I can tell you it is the most powerful journey that you will go on. Um, and what we've done in this podcast is giving you a minute glimpse of some of the journeys and the changes that you'll be, um, your eyes will be opened up to on CPM. And I strongly advise those of you who are who wanting to understand how you see the world, who are wanting to understand that we live our lives by mental models, who want to understand how to take control back and live a life of I, get in touch with Professor Rao. It will change your life. So, Professor Rao, thank you for joining us. Um, and personally, thank you very much for, for supporting me during the last few years, which have been a, a tough journey. Um, and it's always, I'm just very, very lucky to have someone that I can just drop an email who makes time in their diary for me. So uh, a massive, massive thank you. And thank you for everything you're doing to uh, the future for those people and challenging people to, to take back control of, of their lives. So many, many thanks. Thank you, Mark. And if any of your listeners are interested in exploring these topics, but they're not quite ready to take any of my programs, they can get a copy of my book, 
go into greater detail into what we discussed today. Have a wonderful day, Mark, and I wish all of your listeners a super day as well. What amazing insights from the generous and amazingly caring individual that Sikamar Rao is. We've put the links to his website and his book in the descriptions below and would once again like to extend a massive thank you to him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come and give us the benefit of his knowledge and experience of working with thousands of students on the CPM programme. This podcast, as always, is brought to you by our Business Secrets Club, our free-to-join, no catches, no credit cards, and no commitments uh, membership program where we give you up to £20,000 a year worth of free business coaching. Uh, Right, brought to you, one-to-one coaching, mastermind coaching, webinars, all sorts of content. Um, And the only question is just how serious are you about having the life that you wish, a lifestyle by design? Um, Because if you are serious, go join. The link is below, or you can go to tetrakey.com and click the button at the top of our homepage. It's been a pleasure to serve you again in this podcast, and I suggest you take Professor Rao's ideas and concepts and put them into practice for yourself to turn yourself into a business revolutionary. (laughs) 